Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we've got another amazing story coming to us from the U.S. We have director John Yost on board today. John had a frightening experience one summer as a young child, something so awful that his parents could hardly make out his terrifying account of what happened. A series of doctor visits and medical examinations could not conclude exactly what had occurred, but the memories would never leave him. The fact is that John had a close encounter of the fourth kind. Despite this, he grew into a perfectly normal man who married, raised children, and lived a happy life, except for his obsessive preoccupation with home security, paralyzing fear of open skies or deep water, and his abiding sense that he was being watched. Alien abduction answers follows John as he discovers that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people from all walks of life and all over the globe who have experienced something similar. We witness a dramatization of his encounter as a boy, and through a technique called quantum hypnotherapy, we sit in while a highly skilled therapist with over 40 years of experience guides him back to that summer evening where we finally discover what really happened, where he went, and what he learned. The film Beyond John's Story is an exploration into a phenomenon that has left polarizing opinions, leaving some to question the power structure, and even helps offer some insight to the age-old question, are we alone? So before we get into the interview, I'd like to share with everyone two trailers regarding this amazing documentary. So enjoy. Was I being blamed for something? Or we're blessed. Isn't this the strangest thing in the world? That bright, shiny lights in the sky can make you think about who you are as a person. How is that true? There's something coming. And it's going to affect every person on the planet. This is not communication, it's communion. Hundreds of thousands of people have claimed contact. That will change you. It changed me. Last year. This was something that I kept buried for years. Strange things would happen. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. He came at me, and I fought for my life. Ships started to pop up in the sky. And there's this bizarre disk of light. It is moving across the sky very fast. The experience is often very terrifying. If I felt fear, I would crawl under my covers, hoping that it would go away, whatever it was. I know that we were put in that craft. I knew I was going to go to another planet. And the being was right next to my face. He saw two shadow beings. That's when I felt like I was going to die. I had a real encounter with something. Even if I had to live with the fear, is to know the truth, is to know. So John, so thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you. Now, um, can you talk about your family and the, uh, the environment that you grew up in as a kid? Sure. Um, I am the, uh, eldest of what originally was eight children. Two of us passed away, uh, at childbirth. So it ended up me being the eldest and I had uh, four sisters and a baby brother, um, mother and father, uh, uh, they, everybody worked, um, 
you know, we had a home in the suburbs and uh, it was a good life. You know, I grew up a normal, um, normal kid in America during the uh, late 60s and uh, 70s. And, um, you know, I had a nice yard and nice family and, uh, and uh, yeah, er everything, everything was, I don't want to say picture perfect because it was real life. You know, uh, you know, there were always struggles and bullies in the neighborhood and, you know, and <laughs> throw that ball over here or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep the ball if it comes in my yard again, that sort of thing, you know, okay. but, uh, but it was just normal and, and uh, Americana, if you would. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the seventies was uh, an amazing time for me as well. Uh, sure. So, okay, so your experiences start off at the age of four, roughly, I believe. No, no. Well, let, let, let me say this to you. The, the film picks up when I'm seven years old. And only after that do I discover through my regression that they had started earlier. Um, but I did not, to be fair, I did not go in depth into those early um, years. Uh, the the event when I was seven years old and uh, yeah, is, is, is where I, I kind of begin my mind, but where, where it all starts for me. Okay. So let's get into that. Uh, so what um, actually happened to you? Sure. Um, I it was August. It was very humid. Uh, my parents' home did not have air conditioning in it. And uh, I had a second floor bedroom. The windows were open. And it was in the middle of the night, like two or three o'clock in the morning, that sort of thing. And um, I was awakened by this droning sound, kind of this undulating drone, this sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> so I sat up on the side of my bed and kind of rubbed my eyes and looked around. And nothing was amiss. And, um, but I couldn't, I was disturbed. I couldn't go back to sleep. So I went to the bathroom for a glass of water or whatever. And I was in there for a while. And I let the water run for a while. And eventually, I decided I was going to walk back out. I opened the door. And to my complete surprise, standing in the doorway is what to my seven-year-old eyes, my mind thought was this Japanese character that was on television called Ultraman. Now, in television, <clears throat> he was a giant and um, almost looked robotic, uh, very uh, metallic looking, had a little bit of red, and these gigantic bulbous eyes. And um, an oval head. But the, my version of the Ultraman was he was my size. And I'm you know, seven in the story. And um, I, I'm looking at Ultraman. I have no fear. I have no fear at all. And, and so we get very, very close. And, um, and we're nose to nose. And I'm looking, you know, with kind of this fascination, you know, I had like, how did Ultraman get into my, how is he small? How is, you know, the, this sort of thing. And we're standing in the doorway of the bathroom. And um, just then I felt like I might fall down a hill or fall into a pit. I felt myself kind of descending, almost like sand was being pulled out from underneath my heels on a beach. And I immediately went into fight or flight. And uh, I started to flail like a, like a drowning me, you know, um, in deep water. And I actually laid hands on this Ultraman entity character. And, um, and I am struggling for my life because I feel like, you know, I say I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm falling. And um, just then there's this tremendous flash of light. And I feel like I'm moving, but I cannot tell. And I see this light spinning past me. It's almost like you're on a carousel that's way, way too fast or in a bullet train. You can't really make out your environment. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm still in this struggle. And when I kind of come to my senses, I'm in the middle of this struggle, but something really fascinating had happened i am in the place of the ultraman character and 
Ultraman is in the bathroom. So I'm I'm with my back to the hallway. And I'm a little confused, but I'm in the middle of this struggle. And as I kind of go for this entity, he, I say he, he raised his right hand. And there's this another tremendous flash of light. And I feel this impact, um, almost like, um, and once again, I'll use water. So if you're standing in, in, at a beach, you know, say, say you're in the water about chest high and a wave comes in and it hits you and it knocks you down. That's the way it felt. But I felt it impact my shoulder and I fall. This hallway, the entrance to the bathroom, had a small landing and there were stairs that went down. They were all hardwood stairs. And I fell. Uh, I fell really, really hard. And um, uh, it, there, was, there were no carpeting or any kind of buffering there. And I... And I fell because I was completely surprised, and also the force pushed me back. So I land in a heap at the bottom of these stairs, and I am screaming like someone's stabbing me. I'm, I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. My parents, who have a, a first floor bedroom in this home, come running around. You know, they hear their son, you know, bellowing, and. My dad says, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? And, I, and I'm saying, you know, Ultraman is upstairs. He's up. And I'm sure my father heard, you know, intruder, right? So he's a big guy. He ran up the stairs. And he's opening doors. And, and my mother's trying to console me. And I am screaming and crying. And, um, and so my father, after some time, comes to the top of the stairs. And he looks down at me. And he looks at my mother. And he, and he kind of shakes his head like, you know, there's nothing up here, right? And um, and he looks disappointed and also frustrated and disgusted a little bit. I, you know, I had awakened him in the middle of the sleep. So they take me up and they do what parents do. You know, they, they open up the closet. You see, there's nothing here. Look under the bed. There's nothing here. And um, they put me to bed. My mother kisses me on the forehead, and um, and they leave. And I go immediately into like a coma-like sleep. People ask me like, well, how, how the hell could that happen? I, I think what happened was my body was so flush with adrenaline that when that expired, I just collapsed in exhaustion. So the next day, you now mind you, I'm seven years old and it's summertime, so it's school break, right? Um, I, in the seventies, you know, I, kids today you know, have their little machines. But, you know, in the 70s, you were outside, right? So I had a quick breakfast, and I ran outside, and I played with my friends all day long. And um, I came in. My mother called me in for dinner that day. And, you know, I was disgusting because I had been outside in the sun all day. She said, listen, you're, we're going gonna to have a bath before dinner. And I'm a little boy, and I don't want to take a bath. And she takes off my T-shirt, and she says, oh, my God. And she sees my shoulder and she says, honey, what's this? And I said, mom, I, I told you, you know, Ultraman. And she looked really sad. And um, she smiled a little bit and kissed me on the forehead and said, it'll be all right. Honey. It'll be all right. So I took my bath and, uh, had dinner and didn't think about it. A couple of days later, my father was taking me to a doctor's appointment. Uh, and as we pull into the, uh, the parking lot of the doctor's office, he says to me in kind of a gruff manner, he says, now listen, I don't hear any of this stuff about Ultraman. You keep that stuff to yourself. And he said it with some more colorful language. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I, I you know, I, I'm seven years old. I have no idea why I need to keep this quiet or whatever. I just said, "Well, sure, Dad, whatever you say." You know, I wasn't thinking about it. it wasn't front of mind. So, doctor's examining me, and he's looking at the bruises. This is a couple of days after the fall, right? And so the bru bruises are now, you know, yellowing. And, and uh, he gets to my shoulder, and he says, "Whoa, sport!" I said, "What's this?" 
And I just started to say, well, doctor, you know this. And I could see my dad, my father in the corner. And he was glaring at me. And um, I've said before, my father was a big guy. He was a, he was a big guy. <laughs> and uh, back, you know, today, you know, kids, it seems like they're very glib with their mouth. But back in the 70s, you were not so quick to tell your father off. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I was seven. So, uh, and I was the first son and I loved my father. So I saw him and I didn't want to disappoint him. So, of course, I said, uh, I was just not playing. I must have fallen or something. I said, okay. A few minutes later, the examination's done. Gives me a lollipop and sends me on my way. My father's driving me home after that appointment, and we pull into the driveway in front of my parents' home. And uh, he looks back at me, and he says, now, listen. I never, ever want to hear anything about this Ultraman thing again. I don't want you to scare your mother. I don't want you to scare your sisters. I want you to shut your mouth about this. And, you know, once again, the import of that was not, I didn't, I didn't register with me. I was like, well, what? Okay, whatever, Dad, of course. You know, I'll be happy. To, you know, I want to make you happy. I want you to approve of me. Of course. And that's where the lies began. Um, because I was a very active kid. I was a very active teenager in sports. And, um, you know, so you're in the shower room or locker room, whatever. And people say, oh, what the hell is that? You know, and, and to me, you know, it became it became habitual. It wasn't like I was thinking up new stuff. You know, I see that you wear eyeglasses, right? Okay. So I ask you, you know, this morning, did you sit up in bed and say, mm, I want to see clearly today. And so therefore I will take these glasses and put them on my face. That didn't happen. What happened was you got up, you rubbed your eyes, grabbed your glasses, put them on your face and just went about your day. Right. Okay. That's the way it was. It wasn't something that I was thinking about. It wasn't. So, it was just. And I made up all kinds of things. You know, um, I was hit by lightning. Uh, uh, a bear bit me. Um, a swordfish stabbed me. You know, I, somebody shot me. Whatever. But I mean, it was like a ha ha ha, and then it was over, and I didn't think about it. And and to me, I always remembered everything in the back of my mind. I could see it clearly. But it was like something that had happened, you know, I don't know if you if you were like beat up when you were a little kid as a you know, there was a bully. I mean, is that something that is in your mind, front of mind every day? No, of course not. And so it didn't affect me. I didn't think that it affected me. And I lived my whole life that way. And um I went on and, you know, had a normal life, got married, kids and the whole bit. And and I got into film and television and uh, work around the world. You know, I did all kinds of stuff, you know, stuff for, say, Food Network and History Channel and, you know, all this, you know, normal things, you know, Food Channel, this sort of thing. And um, we were doing a project, my team and I, we were doing a project in a place called Borrego Springs, California. And it was, uh, if you've never been there, it's very, very flat. It's very arid. And uh, we had rented this really big ranch house. It was all one floor for everybody. So there were like 15 of us there. And we had a night shoot, which was normal for us. And we all come back. And um, my team and I were downloading all of the footage because we want redundancy. You know, we, we don't want to go out there and shoot and something go wrong with the tapes, right? And then we lose everything. So we're, we're downloading it to hard drives. And so everybody else is out by the pool behind this house. We walk out there, and they're going to have a, a, a nightcap, a drink, a toast. So I, I sat down, and people are pouring, and I had a glass in my hand. and People are going to give a toast. I raise my hand, like back here, to, you know, to clink another glass. And I notice this glint of light in the glass. And my mind is trying to make sense of what that is. And I said, oh, well, that's the moon. You know, that's the moon. And then I, and then I thought, wait a second. There's no moon. This is a new moon. This is darkness. This is why we decided to shoot tonight so we can control the light. 
That's not a moon. And as I drop my glass behind my glass, about 30 feet above the house, you know, this one floor house, was this thing. And it, it was kind of a regular shaped, almost egg shaped. Kind of a blue green luminosity. It was glowing from the inside of it. And my mind again is trying to identify like, what the hell is this thing? And I went, Oh, that's, that's, that's a Mylar balloon, you know, like a get well balloon or a happy birthday, or like metallic. And I thought, wait a minute, that can't, that's as big as a car. And just then my mind says, this is, oh my, and I grab one of my cameramen who is right beside me, his name's Scott, and I turn him and he says, oh my, and as he does, the 15 or 17 people that were with us all kind of turn in different ways. Oh my God, look at that. I can't believe it. What is that? Oh, all this other stuff. And this all happens within, I'm telling you, maybe seven seconds, you know, what, what is that? Oh my God. Oh, look at this, you know, boom, boom, boom. All of this stuff happens. And just then this thing in the sky moves at lightning speed in a zigzag formation and stops right above my head. And, and I tell you, Yon, I don't know how long it was there. It could have been a millisecond. It could have been there for an hour. I don't know. I don't know. But it stops. And when it stops, something happens to me. I'll get into that in a second. But what happens then is after it stops right above my head, it zigzags away from me, like 20 feet, stops again, and then just kind of drifts off into the desert. And as I said, everything was flat. So all of us were all standing there, or I was kind of leaning back, you know, in total surprise. But most of the people were standing and were watching this thing just drift off for about a minute, minute and a half until it blinks out. It was incredible. It was beautiful. It was incredible. Here's the problem. When that thing, whatever it was, stopped above my head for the first time in my life since I was seven years old, I felt that feeling of sinking and falling and the sand coming out from underneath. It terrified me. It petrified me. I hadn't thought about that feeling. And it was visceral. It, it grabbed me. And, and I don't know, I, I know you're from Canada, so you've been cold before, right? And I'm sure that you've been so cold at one point that like your insides have shivered. Like you cannot control how cold you are. That's the way I felt. And I, I couldn't stay there anymore. I couldn't be with these people anymore. Uh, because I was going to lose it. And I, I, I kind of stood up a little, you know, shakily. And I said, I made some stupid joke about everybody being young and I'm the old man. And, you know, I, I'm going to write up my papers. I'm in charge. And you kids can sit out here and drink all night. That's the thing. And I go back to the room and I barricade it. I push the, I push the bed up against the door. I put all my luggage there and I sit in a corner and I weep like a child. And um, looking back on that, I think the reasons are, are twofold. It's, it's number one, you know, I wasn't dealing with this like a 50 plus year old man. I, I was dealing like I was a seven-year-old boy again. This is where it was. The fear was all back. It was this close to my face. I was living that fall again. I was living that. Tra I was living that ignorance again, and uh, and I couldn't. I couldn't grapple with that. I couldn't get my hands on it because I had never dealt with it in forty plus years. And I think also a, a more uh, comprehensive view of this is also because of the lying. I think that uh, exacerbated the problem. You know, when you are duplicitous, when you, when you, I mean, you know when you're lying, you know when you're doing something wrong, you know it. And I think what had happened was that exacerbated 
everything. It, it, it just added, you know, gasoline to that fire of fear. And it just petrified me. So the very next day, I mean, remember, I'm in charge of this group, right? And I'm a professional. I, I do what I do because I'm very anally retentive. And I check boxes and I make sure that I don't spend money that I'm not supposed to spend. And this is why we get all this work around the world. I um, I, I take this hot shower. I come on. I'm going to hard charge. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it right. And I am screwed up. I am screwed up. I am missing things. I am not organized. And I can't get close to the pool. I can't get close. I can't be alone under the open sky. And this is a really hard thing because I, I have to go find locations for the next shoots and stuff like this. This is a major, major problem. So, I, and, and so what happens is these guys that I've worked with for the last 12 years, they notice. You know, I mean, our business is to make sure that things are in place, you know, for films and TV shows and commercials. They notice that there's something wrong with me. And um, and so this is a problem. I somehow struggled through the last three or four days of the shoot. And um, thanks to some delicious triple distilled Irish liquid um, distilled in Ireland by friends at Jameson, um, I got home on the plane. Well, when I get off the plane, my family notices there's something wrong. There's something really wrong. It got so bad, God, that I would go to work an hour early and park right next to the front door and wait for somebody to come and run in with them because I couldn't get out of my car. I, I, or, or if I had, if you know, through meetings or whatever, I had to park away. I would wait until everybody was gone, and then I would run like a maniac. And I'm an ugly runner. Let me tell you something. I'm an ugly crier. And I'm, you know, very strange looking runner. So it was horrible to watch, I'm sure. Uh, but I would do anything not to be under that open sky. And um, and so this is what happened. I was so pissed off, Lon. I was so angry with myself because it was affecting my life. It was affecting my relationships. It was affecting my work. And, you know, I mean, I've worked my entire life to get here. What the, you know, what is going on? So I guess a smarter person would have tried to find, you know, a therapist or something, you know what I mean? But I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to being self-reliant. I said, look, you know, um, I like to read. There have got to be other instances of things like this happening in the world and people who have dealt with it, right? And so I'm going to try to read. And so that led me to interviewing some people. And then that led me to interviewing people on camera. And I, you know, the idea was, hey, listen, let me, let me do this and this will be good for you. And I'll share my story and you can share your story. And then you can have a copy and I can have. And then that led me to making the film because what had occurred, and this is, I know it's going to sound ridiculous and stupid to you, but this is really what happened. All throughout all of this kind of, you know, cathartic work I was trying to do with myself. I never, ever addressed this elephant in the room. I could remember with clarity, if you would have asked me at 15, 17, 25, 30, 40 years, I could tell you what happened on that, in that bathroom. I could tell you unemotionally. I could just tell you what happened. I fell. And boy, isn't that strange. You know, um, it was like I had put a wall between me and it. But I could tell you the details. But the one thing that I could not remember was how in God's name did I get flipped around, you know, in that doorway? I I remember laying hands on this entity and a flash, but I could not t- I could not tell you for the life of how I got flipped around. And so, and through these interviews, someone had mentioned Deb's Shakti, um, who is a quantum hypnosis therapist and a I. I a, a lovely woman. Um, I consider her, and I tell everybody, I consider her my guardian angel. Uh, such a sweet person and a, a service to others person. I recommend her to everybody and anybody I talk to. But she said, John, listen, I 
I can help you relax enough to, to walk down that hallway and to go to the filing cabinet that you created, John, and to open that drawer that you created and to open that file that you created and to look at that information. And all you have to do is just report. You don't have to relive it. You can just report what you see. And um, I was petrified of that, too. I have to tell you. Uh, you know, I had never been hypnotized. or you know. And she said, look, John, you're going to do all the work. I'm not going to do all the work. You're going to do the work. All I'm going to do is teach you to relax enough to allow yourself to go do that because you have these walls that you have built firmly around that. And, and so that you would have, to, this is a really long answer to your, to your yeah. question, but I'm an Irish guy. So if we had whiskey right now, we'd be talking for four or five hours to get to this point. Um, anyway, but at that point, before I had that session with her, I said, you know, this is something that could help other people. This is something that could really help other people because I am certain that I'm not the only one who's lived through this sort of thing. And if they can look at me and watch me fail and be an idiot and, you know, look foolish and be their scaramouche, well, maybe that's okay. You know, if, if, if I can help them because it's helping me. Right. And uh, that's really when the movie came about as a concept, and the pieces started to put together because that was a really, really interesting thing. And also, uh, just a point of interest, the session that actually occurred that day um, was like six, six and a half hours. And uh, it's it's not a reenactment. It's the real session. It's the raw session. Um, we, we, we set up all the cameras and then everybody got the hell out of the building. Uh, and so we just turned them all on. Whatever happened, happened. And I said, look, I need this to be as raw because if I'm full of shit, if I'm a liar, okay, we're going to find out. We're going to find out. And it was a big risk, but um, it still is a big risk. But, uh, but, but it was like six and a half hours. And so we could only put so much into the film, yeah. you know, yeah. but uh, we put the things in that were germane to the topic at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I've got a few questions. Uh, yes, sir. When after yes. the Ultraman yes. came to you, were you able to sleep? You know, for the years that came from that experience, uh, did you have any like like night traumas, fear of the dark, stuff like that? No. This is this is what was amazing to me, is that I, and, and actually you're you're opening up another box. Uh, I'm telling you, my friend. Um, that experience, as a seven-year-old boy, I thought, oh, well, this happened. It was like being beat up by a bully, and that never happened again. And I didn't have any problems with the dark. I didn't have any problems with anything. Um, I um, It caused some trouble in my family, though. Um, I, you know, I, I say this. It's speculation. But my parent, I was, I was seven when this happened. By the time I was nine, my father had left the family, oh. and, and 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 so we lived through a broken home, and so I had uh, I had problems because of that, you know, that separation. But uh, but I think it was because of that stress that it had caused my father. It, it, even in the words that he said to me, I think he recognized that something had truly happened. And that this was a problem. And I think, and then my mother also had many struggles. She had some, she had some struggles with alcohol and things like that after, after this all happened. Mm -hmm. So I think that they actually were more affected by whatever occurred that night. And then, um, but for me, I was okay. I was okay. What I will tell you, and this, I know you didn't ask me this question, but let's jump to this. When that thing was above my head in the desert, I've come to kind of realize or recognize that that was kind of a knock on the door. That was kind of a reawakening that this, 
this is time to do what or whatever. Okay. And when the film was done, I felt, I felt peace. I felt peace. And I thought, okay, well, look, you know, I've told this story. And I mean, there's some things I have to work out, but I, I feel good about that. You know, and it's over. Now I'm having experiences. Now things are happening. Uh, I don't recall any of these things during my childhood, but now as an adult, now that I, the film is done, new things are happening. Now coming back to the uh, the scar, yes, sir. Um, I, I find it strange though that uh, I've seen, like personally, I've seen needle marks from yes, these. Sir. I've seen uh, scratch marks. I've seen scoop marks. Entire yeah. arms totally scooped, yeah. like uh, almost fresh wounds. There were chilled very quickly, yeah. and yours is totally different. It's as if yes, it it's a beam of a sort of energy beam of sorts, or a, a like a burn mark, or it's. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting it, though. It it, it it very close up. It almost looks like a thumbprint. Like like you know what I. Once again, you know, this is a struggle and I really, I never, I, let me say this to you. The session that we went through, there's a lot of stuff in there that hasn't come out yet that I'm, I'm planning on revealing in the next film and whatever. But the yeah, part of this is something I'm going to have to go and readdress this because it is, it is almost as though this put their hand right on me. And right there is this very large it's not a you know it's not a freckle it's it's very large and it looks as though there's some sort of a burn raised and it's raised and it and um it changes color and it also changes uh temperature it'll become very very hot when the rest of me is not you know that sort of thing so i i don't i sincerely don't know what it is except that it is a mark a clear mark to me that what I had was not a dream. It was not, you know, it wasn't a hallucination. It was an encounter with something that was incredible. Did you have missing time during that episode with the Ultraman? Because of, uh, of course you're you're standing one way, then you, you uh, sort of black out and you realize you're. Uh, I I I think you know that I think that in that in that uh, encounter and that struggle, there was missing time. Now, what happens in the film is that you discover where I actually went. And uh, for your listeners, um, I don't want to be accused of holding anything back, but uh, I was not taken to a ship. I was not taken by greys. I, I, I was taken somewhere underneath the ground. Uh, it seemed to me. It, it, they were cave-like stalagmites and stalactites there was moisture and um and there were other entities there too and they appeared to be gray like but they had much longer faces almost like horse like faces uh and so we try to represent them in the very best we could in the film uh, it's hard to be exact but um but the the entity that actually took me was more insectoid uh, had antennae almost like branches, actually, and um, and there was some sort of force that was able to be exercised through those, some sort of coercive force, and I was fighting against it because I did not want to go. And this is what I, you know, earlier you and I were discussing about, you know, you know, did this start when I was three or four or whatever? What happened was through the uh, quantum hypnosis, I realized, in fact, I think I've seen the film, actually, I know that I've been here before. They had taken me there before. Could you, uh, do you know how tall those insectoids were? I can't tell you how, how tall the other, the other beings were because I was in a reclined position, you know, kind of like suspended almost in a, like a, you know, an easy chair. But, um, but the uh, but the insectoid was my size, just about my size. Yeah, it was uh, you know, and I I wasn't I was probably the shortest kid in my class until tenth grade, so I was not a big kid until later. Okay. 
And how tall tall was the the Ultraman? Uh, I I would say uh, four foot high, four and a half feet high. Okay. You know, because that's how tall I was at seven. Okay. So it's basically a gray that. Uh, yeah. what, what, was it a gray? No, it was more insectoid. Like more I insectoid. said, it had it had you know antenna, and it actually had it coming out of its cheeks. It was very strange looking. Wow. Um, other than the, the stalactites while you were underground, did you recognize anything else? Did you see uh, machinery? Uh, well, I, I can tell you there were there were two other things that come to my mind. First of all, at the top, it was like a huge cavern, and at the top there was an irregular sized hole, a regular shaped hole, and it looked like things were hanging down from the that hole, like that was the entrance, and it was massive. Uh, and the second thing is, is that. Um, Remember, I, I, I referenced the, the flashing lights like a carousel. What was in front of me were these, and I mean ginormous screens. There were three of them. And each one of them had, they, they had a million pictures. In them. I don't know how many pictures, but let's see, many, many, many. And all of them, uh, I, can tell you, I can tell you two things. One thing was very funny to me is, you know, at seven years old, you're learning, you know, your, your letters and how to cursive write and sentences and penmanship's a big deal. And, you know, you, you write English from, you know, left to right. Well, these pictures were moving right to left. And I was, I was pissed off as a little kid. I, I told you I'm very anal retentive. I was pissed off because they were doing it wrong. I was so mad. I remember saying, hey, they're, they're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they're, and I was so angry with them. But they were they were they would flash up in different different sequences here and different sequences here, and they would be moving so fast. I could recognize that if this picture in the center was this picture up here in the corner, was this picture down here, and they were all moving so damn fast, you couldn't detect what the pictures were. But I could sense you could see a very definite division between the pictures. It was like a mosaic or a tapestry. Uh, of a mosaic of all these little pictures, but there was information between the lines, and that information was coming through to me. I, I don't recall what it was. I couldn't tell you exactly what it was, but the pictures were like a diversion, and the information was coming through. Now, what, um, and I say this in the film uh, about this, but what I've come to kind of think about is this it occurs to me that maybe this was very specifically on purpose those pictures were it didn't matter what those pictures were. they were to capture my conscious mind so i had something to fixate on and I was angry about the way they were. And they probably knew that I would be angry about that. So I'm fixating on them. And so all of this other information can be downloaded to me completely passively. And I would not struggle in accepting the information. It was coming directly into my subconscious. That's a guess. I'm not a scientist. I have no idea. But that is what I think it was. Did you black out after that? Uh, well, let me say this to you. I, in my, uh, therapy session, I didn't black out. And in my recollection, I didn't black out. Remember, I'm in the middle of the struggle. There's this big flash of light. I see all this moving, moving, moving. And then I'm in the middle of the struggle. So for me, it was one continuous timeline. Um, in, in, in my session with Debs, it didn't seem like I blacked out. It just seems that, okay, I was done and and now it's time to go here. You know, just one thing after another. Um, to be fair, to be fair, I don't know because we haven't, you know, pushed in. This is probably a topic that should probably have, you know, several sessions. Uh, but we just had one gigantic session. And um, so... So I'm sorry, I can't answer that question.
truthfully. Yeah, I don't it, it does seem, though, that you've been not trained, but yeah, they did want it to upload something to your conscience. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Well, the reason why I asked if you, if you blacked out is sometimes they do show us things to uh, a friend of mine, Steve Boucher, who was on the craft, and uh, he just finished his medical examination. Oh. And they told him to look at this sort of black and white spiral. And he did one. I said, no, look at it, look at it. You know, these when you get hypnotized, or on TV, these, these, the, 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 they do show it sort of like, look into the circle and, and it turns. Well, sure. they had that same thing. And eventually he looked at it and he blacked out. Were your parents, like, did they, uh, were they very religious? I was raised Roman Catholic. You know, we, we went to a Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. Um, you know, wore the little ties and little uniforms. Yeah. But um, I wouldn't say overtly religious. My father was passive, passive. But, I mean, we were all baptized and confirmed and that sort of thing. Uh, my mother, uh, really the her Irish heritage had made her probably more more religious, more spiritual, uh, you know, so I could, you know, she, she would be the one that would enforce us going to church, you know, because kids don't want to go. Yeah. So she would be the one that would do that sort of thing. But I wouldn't say, you know, there are some, there are some families that, you know, they, they, they go to worship on a day, they go, they're back at the church two or three days, you know, for Bible study. And it, we weren't those people at all. Now, do you think the fact that, um, Cool. Well, the reason I'm asking is that I've got a friend. Uh, she's from a, she's African and she's from a very religious uh, housing. And uh, um, when I started telling her about my, some of my experiences, she thought that the shadow people were sorcerers. Oh. So, so I'm trying to look at it from, let's like, say, a, a religious point of view. How, like, a family that would have been very religious, how that would have affected them? Sure. Because would they sure. see it as a more of demons? And uh, it's all yeah. about social upbringing, really. Uh, Sure, sure, and, and you know, and that's that's a that's a different kind of, um, you know, um, what do I want to say? I'm trying to say three things at the same time. I apologize. You know, so many people try to put this into a bucket. Okay, these are all grays, or these are all aliens, or these are all demons, or these are all angelic, and I think that's really silly. You know, once again, I don't want to fight with anybody. I don't want to. I think the universe is huge, so there are probably a lot of explanations. And in fact, I'm I'm resistant to anybody who says that I have the answer. And in fact, uh, I've received some some rebuffs about you know the name of the film, you know, Alien Abduction Answers. And I I enforce with these people. I say, listen, you know, it says answers. You know, there's an S on the end. It it really is just more like landmarks you know for people who are trying to find their way in this this is a different way to think about it this is a way to think about it. this happened to me maybe it didn't happen to you maybe it did and you know and, and just for them to go along in some sort of cogent way of thinking about their their experience and dealing with maybe maybe they had fear maybe they didn't have fear you know but we go through that process to allow them you know, that recognition and then to say, listen, there's something on the other side of that fear. You know, there's, there's a place you're going to go. Um, anyway, so I, I really think, I really think that we're probably dealing, and I'm talking about what we, I mean, our species, I think we're dealing with probably like five different agencies or five different origins of, of, of this phenomena. You know, you, uh, it's funny, you know, you and I, we wake up and we hit our coffee machine in our air-conditioned home. We get into our air-conditioned car and we go to our air-conditioned office and then we, you know, go to the air-conditioned store and we go back, you know, this sort of thing. But that's not the way people lived. You know, people lived in nature, you know, in the woods and in fields and this sort of thing. And there is a whole body of literature and reports of, lights and we folk and all of this tied to nature and i think that when we as modern men and women we encounter something like that we're you know our knee-jerk reaction is well that's an alien and and it could be some sort of intelligence from the planet itself this guy and this huge being that we live on and and so i think that's a bucket 
I also think that if, you know, we have to realize that our governments, and I mean in general, not just the U.S. or Canada, I mean, have had technology that we don't know about, we don't understand. I mean, there's always, I always love, you know, the guys who talk about like Area 51. You know, they denied it up until the time the newscaster is outside the sign that says Area 51, and they go, oh, well, you know, uh, yes, it does exist. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, they, they lie about it for all kinds of reasons. I'm not even, that's a political nest of craziness. But, okay, so there has to be some allotment to say that, look, some of the things that are experienced or that nature, like I said, some of that that we're experiencing are technologies that are generated by our own governments, our own technology. Then there's also this idea of nuts and bolts, UFOs and craft from other places. And laugh about this. When people scoff at this, they say, wait a second. We, humans, we have craft drones, satellites that are exploring all over the solar system. And you know what we do? I'll tell you. We take pictures. You know what else we do? We take samples. We take measurements. And I can guarantee you if we found some sort of life on one of these planets, we take a sample of it. I can guarantee you. Or if they were large and sentient, maybe we come down in helicopters and we'd hit them with a dart, and we'd tag them, and we'd follow their migration because we'd want to study them. I can guarantee you we would. So why is it beyond the pale to believe that that is at least a piece of what we're experiencing? Of course it is. Of course it is. And then there's also, there are two more buckets. There's also this thing, but the Earth is so old, like four and a half billion years old. You know, we're so egotistical. You know, we are the and all to, we're the best, we're the greatest thing in creation. The truth is that many civilizations could have lived here before us. You know, you take a look at today, you know, Russia, you know, threatening, you know, we can, we can bomb the crap out of you, you know, South Korea or North Korea, we can bomb the crap out of you. Okay, our own governments have bunkers and they have underground, you know, command centers for continuation. Okay, suppose the, suppose the the, the Earth was hit by a, a comet or something, destroyed ninety nine percent of everybody. Our the richest guys and the richest gals and the smartest they'd be underground. You and I would be fried. Okay, so a couple of us would live. How many years would it take for us not to teach our children about the alphabet and calculus? We would be teaching them how to live, how to eat. Okay, so after about forty years, these cats come out and their technology, which has just kept going. And they go, wow, those are some crazy people. We're going to stay where we are and just continue on with our civilization and have this kind of parallel. So, so there's room in this scope for that sort of thing, too. And then on the last bucket, and I don't mean it to be the last, it's probably the primary bucket. There's this thing that we have as a species identified as ultra-terrestrial. You know, this this thing that we have identified as a spiritual or gods or or angels or demons something that is literally outside our dimension that literally defies our physics that somehow pushes in interacts somehow and then pops out of it just evaporates and you know i have used this example because people say oh that's woo woo and everything i say well listen think about it this way you know, you and I, maybe you've heard me say this before, you and I were standing at the edge of a pond, okay? And I stick my face into the pond, okay? I'm literally pushing myself into this dimension of the pond, okay? Here's a really important question at the end of this. Watch. So this fish comes up, sees me. I don't look like a fish. I don't look like anything this fish has ever seen, right? I move like nothing it's ever seen. It's completely lost its mind. What the hell is this thing? In its sky, by the way, its sky, because I'm pressing into that level. And then here's the most important question there. This fish has no concept at all that this face is attached to a head, is attached to a neck, is attached to a body, is attached to a sentient being that has a complete life, completely separate, not always concentrating on the damn fish, 
It's not the center of my universe. Okay. I've got all kinds of other things that I'm dealing with. And I came in. And so what I did was I popped back out to get a breath of air and walk on my way. The fish tells its friend, fish come over. There's nothing there. There's no evidence. You're an idiot. You're a woo woo. You're a crazy person. This is part of what we are experiencing too. The problem is, is that we, as species, we are used to control. We are used to control. This is why I flailed like a maniac when that thing, because I felt myself losing control. Our sense of ego is so important. We need to be in control. We, you know, we wake up every day. The sun rises in the east. It goes. Okay, anything out of the normal disturbs us. So we like to control that. This thing that comes in totally disrupts. And it has ultimate and complete power over us. We, like robots on an old TV show, um, uh, Lost in Space, does not compute. We like short circuit because how dare you? Don't you know who I am? I have myself. This is inhumane. I am in control. And they're going, no, not at all. Not at all. You're part of this. And you're going to participate. However, this is good. And you can participate and not struggle this is part of that message and we have a problem so what happens is this everybody who experiences this sort of thing we kind of come to that same realization but we cannot help being humans so we get into this camp or this camp or this camp where I have the answer. No, I have the answer. No, I have the. They're gray. They're they're this. They're spirits. They're you know mm-hmm. they're sorcerers. They're yeah. demons. Okay. And so now what we've allowed is we've allowed our ego once again to create our own subshell within this big tent, and we are going to possess all the answers. And it's just this never-ending, idiotic insane way we are about ourselves that we must have a final answer i am always afraid and i warn everybody i said listen anybody anybody who says me included anybody who says i am the absolute 100 percent, the universe is how big shut up yeah you know I have to, so I have to bring every kind of disclosure to you, sir, or you, miss, and you will distribute the. Wait a minute, that sounds an awful lot like another government or another religion, or another, you know what I mean? We just can't help ourselves, so I try to avoid that at all costs. Humans and love say, labels, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just call me an idiot. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that. Well, I loved your analogy with the fish because in 2008 I was the fish. Yeah. <laughs> So imagine me, I'm in my bed. Now, we, we did talk about this beforehand, but uh, I'm in my bed, 2008, summer, uh, again, second story uh, apartment, very hot, windows were open. And so this was about around 6 a.m. So, you know, there was, there was light coming in through. And I looked, you know, I looked around into the bedroom and uh, I, I, could, I could still see fairly well without the glasses. And I'm just looking around and I realized there's something hovering above me. And I take the time to really fixate on it. And I start, and I realize there's, there's a black line. So I start going around the line. Then I sort of define an upside down guitar pick or pear shape, but upside down gu- guitar pick. Then I said, oh, could it be a face? And I start concentrating in, through it, uh, in it, because it was, it was semi transparent. So I re- then I realized at the top there were two round, perfectly round, huge red, uh, black eyes. Mm. And uh, then the face would go, go down. You know, for the the bottom part of the the guitar pick, yes, and I looked at it for like thirty seconds. So I, I didn't panic; I was fairly calm, and uh, I thought to myself, "Oh, it's could be a a ghost because you know there's a lot of ghost stories in my family." And for some reason, then I get the feeling, "Oh, I'll just turn to my side," and and I hugged my girlfriend at the time, and I fell asleep. Sure. That's it. So I was the fish. So you. It came, you know, the, the face came to me. It changed my world, and which it, it, it very did change my world. Yes, and um, and you know that's that. So I thought I thought it pretty funny that you brought that up. Yeah, good timing. Uh, so let's get into the the documentary. Uh, sure. Alien abduction answers. I I've watched it. I've streamed it with my girlfriend, and we loved it from from, oh. from the get go. It was. I'm it glad. Was, Thank you. It was very good. 
the tempo was good and so i think it's a it's a good film for everyone uh from you know from beginners to those that have had experiences so how did everybody how did everything come together sure uh well <clears throat> i was i was very very blessed um with, uh, as I mentioned, Debs, who happens to be, uh, I asked her to be an associate producer at one point because of her contributions to me. And um, also she became, um, you know, you and I had talked about, you know, especially with COVID, people are all around the country. You know, how do you get all these people together? How do you organize this? And so she, she really helped me. And Melissa Kane, who's one of the experiencers, had a... Um, she has a, a resort uh, right in Wisconsin called uh, McGrath's Big Arb, uh, and it's uh, it's a beautiful place. And so this is where we shot a lot of the interviews with the experiencers, and it was uh, very close to nature, so it was very peaceful and serene. And um, it was a, it was a good place for me to kind of center myself too, because you know when people think of you, you know as you know, in show business or whatever, they they don't think of you as a human being. You know, they oh well, you're an actor or you're a direct. You know, you you can't be. But I always say, listen, we're real people. You know, just like you. And so I ask people, I say, listen, you know, can a police officer be a victim of crime? Of course, of course. Just because they're a cop doesn't mean they can't be robbed, right? Okay, so. I, as I said to you, this was catharsis for me. I, I really needed this piece. And uh, so that's that's how we got all of the people in there from. It, it, the beautiful part about these experiencers are this, you know, we completely dismiss the, uh, the red herring that these people are, you know, Looney Tunes or wearing, you know, tinfoil hats. These people have master's degrees. They're family people. They have their own businesses, um, international companies. You know, one gentleman is a genius designer. One is an artist and a teacher. I mean, these are these are real salt of the earth folks that have had incredible experiences. Which, by the way, as a as a tangent, you know, really opens the idea that all of us have really experienced something. You know, uh, Ray Hernandez, I don't know if you know his work, but, you know, he, he, he is fond of saying, you know, you take a hundred friends or a hundred people that you know, put them in a room and ask them, hey, is, listen, be honest with yourself. Has something happened in your life once that was odd or strange or something that you could not explain? He said, you'll find out that the majority of those people will have to admit you know, they might not want to get the details with you, but they'll have to admit that the answer is yes. Okay, and so, so these 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 people, um, everybody, they, they were so beautiful and so wonderful and giving and trusting, and um, I, I I truly totally in love with them. And I'm so grateful for the friendship now. And uh, so that was that was a big piece of that. The um, the session with Deb Shakti was another huge piece of this film, as you know, and it's scattered throughout. Um, a lot of people, you know, wonder, you know, is this just my story? No, what this is, is me saying, I'm an idiot and I've had something kind of traumatic happen to me and I'm desperate to find the story, find the information. So I'm literally going, begging people. And I literally, people ask me how I produce a film. No one begs like me. Because, you know, if you don't answer me, I'll you'll find me camping in your front yard, uh, you know, <laughs> to answer my calls, which leads me to probably one of the most important elements of this film. You know, the film features a gentleman named Mr. Whitley Strieber. Now, I, I can't believe anybody or anybody in your audience doesn't know who Whitley Strieber is, but I will just say that Mr. Strieber, you know, wrote about his, um, his encounters in uh, several books starting in the 80s, uh, beginning with the uh, book Communion. And um, I respect this guy so much that uh, even though I, I would never claim we're friends, but I would say we're very friendly. 
Uh, in fact, we talk every, you know, four, six weeks, you know. Uh, but I, I, to this day, even though we had all this experience together, I can't call him Whitley. I have to call him Mr. Streeper to his face. And I think he gets a kick out of it. I, I really think he's actually a very funny guy. And I, he teases me a little bit about that, but that's okay. Mr. Streeper, I call him. Um, but I didn't know him, you know. And Debs knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who actually had had some conversations with him. And so I begged. I got to the top of that mountain and I begged. And he was very skeptical, I have to tell you. Mr. Streeper was very, very skeptical. And uh, I, with all, he has every right to be. You know, there have been a lot of people who have come after this guy. You know, he has gone through the ringer. And, um, and so he ended up interviewing me first. You know, I, I, I kid you not. He interviewed me to make sure that I was genuine, that he wanted to see my credentials. He wanted to do all kinds of research. I had to write him a letter this whole bit. And then, in fact, uh, I had to write him all the questions. Now, to his credit, um, there are two things that really stand out in my mind about Mr. Streber. Number one, all the questions that I asked him, you know, I had to write them and send them to him. He didn't change a single one. He didn't ask me to mitigate one. And I asked some very hard questions and some, you know, some difficult questions, some pointed questions. He didn't ask me to change a single one. So I thought, wow, a lot of integrity there. You know what I mean? The second thing was, is that uh, when I finally met him in the flesh and we were, you know, we we're going to meet and we're going to talk a little bit. And the next day we're going to do the interview. I said to him, I said, listen, sir, you know, I'm going to make sure that, you know, we make you look great on camera and all this other stuff. And we're going to have this set up here. And, and he stopped me, he interrupted. And he said, John, he said, look, I, I, I don't give a damn how I look. He said, I care about the truth and the message. And I thought, you know, I'm not used to people like you, you know, you know, in, in my business, you know, make me look, you know, give me a human head, you know, make sure that I don't look fat on camera, all this other. But he didn't care about any of that. What he wanted was he wanted the truth. So I said to him, you know, part of our deal, and once again, to his credit, I said, look, sir, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the entire video of your and my conversation, and I'm going to give it to you unedited. You bring it back with a red pen. Tell me this is off limits. This is off limits. Don't talk about this. Take us up. To his credit, he gave me no edits at all. Not a single one. And then when the film was done, part of our deal was that he would have the final imprimatur, you know, because he, of course he is a, a you know, I hate to say this because it makes us commercial, but he has a brand, you know. I mean, this is a guy who has He's an international best-selling writer, a speaker, um, and he watched it, and he said, John, he said, you told the truth. Hmm. I have no edits. So when people think about that, I mean, you know, regardless of what you think about Mr. Streber himself, you have got to recognize the man for the integrity that he has. Um, and... Uh, and so what, the role that he plays in this film is, you know, you saw, you talked about the tempo and things like that. Some of this stuff is emotional, you know. Some of it's instructional, but some of it's emotional, and, and it has affected people. And he's kind of that counterpoint. You know, you see this emotional thing happen, and he's lived it all the way through his life. And we kind of cut to him, and he, he reframes it for people who are experiencing fear or trauma, and he, he asks you, the audience, to look at it through calmer eyes. You know, if you were not afraid, would you examine it this way? Would you look at it this way? And he, he, presents, he presents kind of a security blanket for the viewer that they can observe this from a safe distance and say, you know, I never thought of it that way. It never occurred to me. And so I, um, <laughs> I'd like to say it was a genius move by a brilliant filmmaker. I'd like to say that it was it was total luck, and me begging, <laughs> and that's the truth. The title of his book, Communion. When you think yeah. about it, what what is communion? And I, I try to see it as a like a, a from two 
perspectives. One, let's say we the religious factor when you sure. a communion with God, sure. and when it comes to well, a communion with the the ETs, well, again, you're you're naked in a sense that you know the the fact that they're telepathic, yeah. they, they see through you. Same thing with yeah. God. Yeah. So you, they're, you, you're you're practically naked with them. So the there's a, like a physical aspect, spiritual aspect, and uh, emotional aspect, and they they know your life story basically. Same thing with God. So. Uh, I found that interesting as a title book. You know, one of the things that I spoke to him privately about was communion, the title. Yeah. And it uh, turns out, I don't know if you know this, but the idea for the title was actually his dear wife's. Oh. Yeah. Ann Streber is the one who suggested that they use the word communion. And the second very interesting thing about that is this, you know, you're a very intuitive guy and you've interviewed a lot of people. And so you get, you know, the double entendre there and the interweaving of those meetings. And think about this, you know, a few minutes ago, we were talking about integrity. Well, wouldn't everybody be forced to have integrity? If we were all telepathic, wouldn't we all have to tell the truth? Wouldn't we all, wouldn't that be the best that we could be something to achieve? And I think really this is, this is kind of leading toward the end of this film. You know, I pause it at the end. I say, listen, you know, there's more to learn. There's more to find out. How can these bright, shiny lights in the sky, and nothing against CE fibers. This is not what my point is. I'm not juxtaposed to this. But how can how can these bright, shiny lights in the sky make me want to re-examine my life? Make me want to re-examine my role in society, in my family, you know, on this earth, in my country, as a citizen of this world, as a citizen of, the, uh, of this universe? How can it make me want to be a better person? How does that even connect? Well, what it leads back to is this centralized issue of our ego. That we are the final arbiter of truth. We are the final arbiter of what is right and what is wrong. When really, you know, there is a black and a white. You know, you probably shouldn't hit that cat. You should probably not do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, but he may be mad. Okay, that's a reason, but that's not correct as i said to you before you know uh we got online you know people are so so determined to be right they could give a damn about being correct you know and 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 i i know i might offend some people it's just because i'm an old guy i know people keep saying well i have to speak my truth okay okay listen I'm an old guy. When you used to say my truth, that was an opinion that no one else shared. That's what we used to call that back in the day. Okay. My truth. How about the truth? Right? Look, this is a coffee cup. You can say it's a bathtub. It's a coffee cup. It's a coffee cup. It's a coffee cup. Okay. You can interpret things through your own experiences, and they can be whatever you want. And, they, and however that affects you and the strategies that you use to deal with that and to become a better person, if it's something that pushes you towards the light, pushes you towards the good, pushes you towards unity with your people around you, then I can tell you that your truth is probably the truth. If it's something that separates you, that puts you at odds, that makes you want to fight, that makes you want to strangle out somebody with a different opinion, I have the sense that it might not be the truth. And what I think is we as a species have got to let go of our possession of the truth because our truth used to be there were no UFOs. Our truth used to be that the military was not studying UFOs. Our truth used to be only stupid and crazy people would ever talk about that. That was our truth. And a lot of people had that truth. 
See what I'm saying? Remember all the tabloids back in the day in the 80s? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah. well, before we wrap up, uh, do you have a, um, like a certain message regarding your, your movie uh, to sure. those that might want to watch it? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much. If you've watched this entire conversation, you are a glutton for punishment. Uh, nobody, I mean, I thank you that you're listening to Jan because he's a very pleasant guy. I'm not so pleasant. I'm trying to be, though. Trying, trying to get better. I'll say this, you know, uh, I, I said this thing on earlier, you know, a lot of people with a lot more knowledge than I do and a lot more science behind them and a lot more experience and research have tried to make documentaries and they made very, very good films, but what they are is they're impersonal because they're not filmmakers. They're more kind of like lectures. Our documentary is more like an immersive experience for the viewer you will be with me from the very beginning when i am suffering you'll experience that fear in a very visceral way you'll see me go through these struggles ask the stupid questions find out how dumb i am figure out these truths from other people listen to other people's opinions and in there you will find your nuggets of truth things that will help you along your way to the end of that film where you discover that it's just the beginning. It's not the answer. It's the beginning of growth. And that's really what I was hoping to do. I was hoping that I could inspire people to look outward. And then eventually you end up looking inward because this is the way this works. It's so crazy. And I can't explain it to you. You have to go through it. But hopefully the film will help you. And it's just the beginning. I'm, I'm planning several more because this is a huge subject and you can't eat an elephant in one bite. So don't look for all the answers. And for people who are much more advanced, like Young, this is still a good film because this will be able to translate very difficult concepts to other people who aren't as advanced as you. And so I hope, I hope I pray that it is a blessing to you. It has given me some sense of peace and I, I wish that peace to you. Well, uh, beautiful message. So, uh, well, thank you again for coming on. I had thank loads you, of fun today. It's been fun uh, contacting <laughs> you. you. And uh, so, um, well, to those watching, hope you enjoyed uh, today's interview. I'm your host, Mr. Great. More interviews coming up, and I'll see you guys next time. So, thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Great, and thanks for watching today's episode. If you are an abductee, contactee, or experiencer, and you believe that your story could help others, please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomenon and the future, remember, truth will out.